Well, you may have heard the prosecutor investigating possible illegal meddling in the 2020 election in Georgia has agreed to immunity deals with at least eight Republican fake electors who signed a certificate falsely stating that then-President Donald Trump had won the state. And there's also two other folks who accepted a deal. That's the deal that really might uh, get on uh, Donald Trump's uh, case. Wouldn't you say, Greg? Yes, indeed. <laughs> Greg Pallas here. Election crimes uh, never stop. But the good news is for uh, justice is that eight of the people that were targets of Fannie Willis, that's the prosecutor in Atlanta, these are the eight, eight of the electors, that is, of the fake electors. These are people who submitted their names saying that they had won election as electors to the Electoral College. As, as you know from third grade civics, we don't vote for president, we vote for electors. The problem is that these electors were never elected. They were never even on the ballot, but they had their names submitted. Now, since the mails were used to submit their names, it actually goes to the National Archives, and it was supposed to go from there to Mike Pence to open the envelopes at, on January 6th, as we should know by now. Um, they never got elected anything, so this is a fraud. This is a felony crime. But uh, Fannie Willis knows that these so-called electors, they're just like local schmokels, you know, they're uh, the, the local baker, the local pharmacist right. down in Athens, Georgia, or down in Forsyth County or whatever. Um, they are not arch criminals. In fact, it's very clear that they were told by Rudy Giuliani and they were told by the head of the Republican Party and a state senator that this is all quite legal, that they're just putting in their names in case Trump wins his case in the federal court or state court overturning the results in Georgia, that would preserve his electoral votes. The problem is, <laughs> that's crime. And so Fannie offered them immunity. What immunity means is that you have to tell the truth if you accept the immunity agreement. So that's trouble for um, those who, in, what they could testify at, unless they sh shock us and say that Donald Trump personally called them to sign on as fake electors. I don't think that this is going to harm Trump at all. What will, it does, though, threaten Rudy Giuliani, uh, Sidney Powell. It threatens uh, certainly the head of the Republican Party, Schaefer, uh, in Georgia, and uh, as well uh, Georgia State Senator, because they're the ones who assured these people everything is legal. And, of course, it isn't. So they've accepted immunity. Now, the danger for, for the GOP, especially Trump, Giuliani, and friends, those eight who agree to immunity still are using the lawyers provided by the Republican Party. So they're kind right. of trying to get them to get all their stories together and not implicate each other. But two have run off the ranch, including um, the uh, head of the Republican Party in Coffee County. Now, Coffee, yes. where, I, where I was down there reporting from Douglas, it's in my film Vigilante, Coffee County, which is a strong Republican stronghold, the head of the party there would, not only was an elector, but agreed to you know, uh, help them get tapes from the county clerk, the voting machine tapes. Now, remember... When we say voting machines, there are no, there's only paper ballots in Georgia, but the machines tally them. You do have scanners which keep the tally, and they're trying to prove that those tally machines, which were provided by Dominion Systems, were somehow rigged. They got the tapes. They couldn't, there was no indication that there was any rigging at all, but conning an agency, a government agency, into giving you what might include information to identify particular voters and votes, that's a no-no. That's, that's a serious crime under state law. So the fact that the Republican leader of Coffee County uh, is getting her own lawyer and will, uh, indications are she will take the immunity, that's problems for the real problems for the GOP. I should note that those tapes might actually be public documents. But if you want such documents, you have to do what, uh, what I did. For Flashpoint, which is I filed a Freedom of Information Request Act, 
And when the state refused, I went to federal court and got a court judgment. I didn't figure out how to, like, break into the office or hack the computer. That's a crime. Right. That's a crime. Or if you constantly, you know, so I don't commit crimes to get the information. But apparently Rudy Giuliani, despite being a former prosecutor, didn't understand. <laughs> right, he didn't get court. it. All right. Right. He didn't get the memo, or he thought he was immune because he thought Donald Trump would probably give him, right. grant him uh, a pardon for crimes he was in the midst of committing. Well, he thought he had the right hair polish, but then he realized <laughs> under the heat, <laughs> well, <laughs> listening he found, to you know, Flesh. I, Hold I, on, I let, me, let me jump in here. Greg, I, I want to apologize. I forgot to tell people on your last name, which is Pallast. We're speaking with Greg Pallast. You can check him out at gregpallast.com. We've been doing the Election Crimes Bulletin for a long time. This isn't that, uh, but we wanted to... De- Greg is also a very skilled financial reporter, so I wanted to grab him on, on this issue because it was just breaking in terms of the uh, DA... Uh, in Atlanta. But Greg, uh, we're pressed for time. And I wanted to also get to you on the banking stuff. And it is disgusting. There's no reporting on the way in which, once again, the middle class, the working class is going to get brutalized to bail out rich people. But this is just a couple of lines uh, from AP. And then I want you to jump in, Greg. And by the way, by the way, uh, don't do this at home. I'm a trained economist. I, was a, I lectured at London School of Economics and Cambridge University Department of Applied Economics. So let me tell you, I've talked to several economists uh, who actually are real economists, not like Powell, not, you know, not po- politicians, who all said the same thing. What the heck is this guy doing raising interest rates once again? It's punishing the victims. First of all, Absolutely. the entire press, right to left, New York Times to Wall Street Journal, Fox News to MSDNC, I don't care. They all said the same thing. The danger is that employment is rising. And if we don't, if we don't cool off the jobs market, and let me translate, that means throwing about a million and a half people out of work. If we don't throw people out of work and reduce wages, then we're going to have terrible inflation. Everyone seems to agree with that, except for the economists I've spoken to, and not one, not one Ph.D. has said that this makes any sense because we have, um, as the great economist Nomi Prince says, this is a, a supply squeeze inflation, not demand pull. I mean, let me give you a couple quick numbers. In the past two years, a $100 basket of your typical purchase items now costs $114. We've had 14% inflation over two years, 14%. The average Salary, yes, has gone up. The average production worker salary has gone up by 9.5%. What that comes down to is that the average worker has lost $4,000 a year in purchasing power. Yeah, your wages have gone up $3.71 an hour, including benefits. Big, okay, that, I know you're living high on that, Dennis, the $3.71 yeah. an hour. Oh, yeah. And then oh, in addition, yeah. you're falling behind. So you can't be a wage push or an employment push inflation. It is caused by, by the way, apparently Powell didn't know that there was an invasion of Ukraine, which caused oil prices to, sh- to jump through the roof. Ukraine is also one of the largest exporters of grains and edible oils, so there goes food. China... The biggest, America's biggest port, which is Shanghai, not Los Angeles, but Shanghai, ba- shut down because of COVID, and that caused a tremendous drop in supplies of particularly low-end chips that we need for cars. So we literally had 1.3 million cars could not be made in the United States because of a lack of chips. When you lose that much supply, auto prices for used cars went through the roof. That's 8% of our consumer price index. I know it's a lot of numbers, but basically it comes down to this. Produ- the average worker is the victim of this inflation, not its Absolutely. cause. And you cannot, you cannot bring down this inflation, a supply squeeze inflation, unless, number one, you increase supplies. By the way, let's start with ending the embargo on Venezuela, the, the world's largest reserves of oil. That would make a huge difference. Instead of... Instead of taking their foot off Venezuela's neck, they're putting their foot on the worker's neck, and that won't do it. And by the way, just one quick thing for those of you who took Econ 101, you probably remember something called the Phillips Curve, in which they told you that rising employment will lead to rising prices and inflation. Well, as 
That's what this is all based on, is this so-called Phillips curve. But as Powell's own economists issued a paper last year saying, quote, the Phillips curve is dead. It's dead. Stop relying on this thing because it's hurting workers, and that's not the cause of inflation. That's his own economist, and he told his own economist to go fly. We're still going to stick it to the working class. Now, and, Greg, and, we're, yeah. we're just about out of time, but I, I want to, you to make this point. Every yes. time there's a bailout like this, it really is, it becomes a shift from of wealth from the working class and the middle class, and you can f- hear the sucking upwards, right? Because we're, well, we're, we really are, the people really are, the workers are really paying for the bailout, and these guys do it again and again. Well, think, uh, here's a quick number that you need to know. Chase, J.P. Morgan Chase, Jamie Dimon's bank, made right. $13 billion in profit in the first three months of the year, more than they've made in, in their entire existence because of the rising interest rates. Not everyone gets hurt by interest rates. Not everyone gets hurt by inflation. They're raking it in. Uh, Chevron and ConocoPhillips both reported the, the best year they've had in their 135-year histories in terms of profits, massive Amazing. profits. So wow. you got profiteering by oil companies. And by the way, I would note that in England, the so-called conservative government imposed a 25% windfall profits tax on energy companies because they say it's war profiteering. Prices are going up because of the war in Ukraine. It's not because they're, they're you know, uh, finding right. a, a better sales it. pitch. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. war profiteering. And, and at least in England, they're charging a war profiteering tax on energy companies. Well, and that's and a so good idea. Let me just mention next week, Dennis, I'm going to have a special conversation for Flashpoint's listeners with economist Nomi Prince, where we're going to break it down in detail. It'll be Beautiful. fun, and you'll we'll, enjoy it, I promise. We're looking, for, we're looking forward to that, and we'll let people know exactly when it's going to be. Greg Palace, yeah. gregpalace.com. Check out the film Vigilantes. Go there. Uh, you'll learn a lot. Greg, thanks for coming with us today. We appreciate it. You're the best, Dennis. Thank you so much. Bye.